Hello and welcome to Swipe. Coming up, tech stars of the future. We meet the university students trying to change the world around us. Brain drain, are we losing too many young entrepreneurs to overseas tech hubs? Repair in the air, the futuristic aircraft that fixes itself. And monsters ate my birthday cake. That and other iOS games in our review. This week we're at Imperial College London, where some of the world's brightest engineering students have been working on inventions which could one day change our lives. But is the UK the right place for them to get their careers off the ground once they graduate? I've been finding out. When muscle-stimulating bodywear is among the projects showcased at a London university, you can be pretty sure you're in the company of some very talented individuals. So, up. Oh, uh, so bizarre. And down. Oh, it's just like having pins and needles that yes. are really intense. <laughs> <laughs> These students are innovators whose engineering creations could one day change the world around us. It's no surprise many from Imperial College have gone on to work for giants like Apple, LG and Sony. After all, promising young tech talent is in high demand. But for Britain to benefit most from its rising tech stars, it needs to be able to hang on to them, which is easier said than done when places like Silicon Valley are offering highly paid internships. Not all of these students, though, are convinced by the bright lights of success that could be waiting for them in the US. I think the States is very um, financially driven, and I think that somehow dilutes people's ambitions and the core kind of idea and the, and the drive and the love behind the project that they're doing. It's providing enhanced sensory information. I think we're uh, now at a time where it's probably okay to be based in London and still be able to, to collaborate with companies in the US. I mean, you can meet all of these uh, participants in, in conferences and, and connect up with them and, uh, and then see, see what happens. It seems these guys want to remain where they trained, for now anyway, but their tutors are all too aware of a bigger picture. One of the key issues for a a place like the United Kingdom and our major cities, Birmingham and London and uh, Glasgow, is can we compete? You know, can we develop and run an enterprise culture that is as dynamic as the San Francisco Bay Area? One former UK student who has been lured by the glittering opportunities of Silicon Valley and is earning more than £35,000 as an intern there, told me there's more support for startups in San Francisco. Here, I, I, I think the, the difference is that, uh, you know, you can try things, you can fail um, continuously until you hit the, the, the right spot and people will not hold that against you. But back in Britain, where East London's rapidly expanding tech city is thriving, investors, even ones originally from America, say setting up a business in Silicon Valley doesn't mean it'll last forever. For us, we see that overall as a net positive when people leave. They typically want to come back to Europe at some point, and when they do, they bring back more knowledge and capital with them. People generally tend to come back to where they're born. I think every immigrant, including the two of us, we're both Americans from the East Coast, at some point in our lives will probably like to go back home. So remember this face. She could be Britain's answer to Steve Jobs one day, but whether her and her peers will still be in Britain by then remains to be seen. Gemma Morris, Sky News. Well, joining me now is Ife and Ye Wan. You're both recent graduates. Congratulations. You're officially now inventors and designers. Are you going to stay in the UK to begin your careers? Yes, of course. I think London is a really nice place to start up for the young people because it has a lot of potential, such as funding and market space and also people to network with. So I think it's really helpful for the young startup. But I think for international students, it's kind of tricky to stay here because of visa issues. So UK government has a lot of restrictions for the further um, like entrepreneur like, jobs. Okay, and you're both international students, aren't yes. you? Ife, you're from China originally, yes. but do you want to remain in the UK? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, even though I've heard a lot of rumors saying that the pay is a lot better over in the States, and to be, for me specifically, it's much easier for me to get a US visa because I grew up there. Um, but I really do want to try to get a place to and remain here in London, just to the fact that because all the people I've met here in my five years studying here are a lot more devoted and a lot, a lot more passionate and truly in love with, with what they're doing. So it's actually easier for you to be in the States and start working in the States, but you'd rather stay 
in the UK. Yes, that's correct. And a really interesting trend that's emerging is a lot of the startups are basing themselves in London because you have a much further market reach, but they're getting investment from the States. So what they're doing is they're starting up their companies here in London and then going over to the States to pitch and then bring the money back into London and develop their, their companies here. So is that something that Britain needs to work on then? More investment over here so then they wouldn't have to go over to the States? I think definitely. Yeah, I think, yes. yeah. I think so. Okay, well, best of luck with your futures. Thanks for talking to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, planes that split into three. How technology is changing warfare. Staying with next generation devices, here are a few Bluetooth has been showcasing this week, including a way to control 50,000 gadgets from one smartphone. Bluetooth isn't just about mobile headsets anymore. A new generation of wireless technology is ready to transform homes, exercise, medicine and even farming. It's because Bluetooth 4.0 lets smart devices talk to each other using very little power, like these light bulbs from the Cambridge-based company CSR. One app can control tens of thousands of them at once, right down to changing the colour of each individual bulb. And the technology has even greater potential. Using a mesh network technology like this enables you to build some intelligence into the network. Now that means when I walk into a room, it can turn the lights on if it's dark, it can set the heating to my desired temperature, and it could even turn on the TV to my favourite channel. Bluetooth's use of low-power radio also has energy-saving benefits. The Lupo Key Fob, a sensor you can ring to find lost valuables, has a battery life of six years. But there are limitations to the technology. If Lupo goes missing, you can only track it within 50 metres. It's not just keys you can monitor. Fitness gadgets can link up to measure your whole exercise regime. But it might not always be welcome. Polar's devices get together to detect when you're not pushing yourself hard enough and even remind you when you haven't worked out in a while. There's even more detailed health measurement from Cardio. Their brightly coloured blood pressure monitors can upload months of readings to the cloud. The results can automatically be analysed and sent to your doctor, potentially saving time and money. And health monitoring doesn't stop with people. The WellCal Bluetooth device is swallowed by cattle to measure stomach acidity. Thankfully, there aren't plans for a human equivalent just yet. Stuart Duggan, Sky News. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, Wills and Harry host a Google Hangout. That's and more tech news. Now, what will planes look like in the year 2040? Some scientists predict they could have energy beams which can destroy missiles. We've been finding out more. It might look like a trailer for a big budget video game, but this transformer plane could be the future of real life warfare. This week, BAE Systems lifted the lid on the technology they've been developing, including energy beams for destroying missiles and vehicle parts that mend themselves. They also showed off animations of 3D printed drones designed to rescue people. But they're not the only people developing warfare technology. Samsung Techwin developed a sentry robot designed to operate in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. It was designed to spot suspicious activity, talk to intruders, and even open fire when asked to. But many people are concerned about drones and robots replacing soldiers on the battlefield. One of the things that scares me most about technological developments, and I'm, I'm a lover of technology, I love autonomous robots, it's been my life's passion, but I'm really concerned about the military use of autonomous weapons because they have a sort of science fiction conception. At the moment we know that no autonomous robot could comply with international humanitarian law in terms of being able to, discrim to discriminate between a civilian and a combatant. Cutting-edge technology has always played a key role in warfare, but the influence today's developments will have on future wars is unclear. Will Sargent, Sky News. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, we take a look at the latest iOS games. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed over the past few days. If you're a Google Glass wearer, a new app could mean you'll be able to take photos using just the power of thought. MindReader uses a biosensor headset to measure brain waves, and if you concentrate hard enough, Glass takes a photo of what you're looking at. 
But don't get too excited. Google hasn't approved it yet, so it won't be available through the official Glass App Store. Hello. Hi. Princes William and Harry made royal history this week by taking part in a Google Hangout. The pair appeared via webcam live from Buckingham Palace and spoke to five young people making a difference in Commonwealth countries around the world. It was to launch the Queen's Young Leaders program. Well, myself and William are here just to show our support for all the young leaders across the Commonwealth and you know, especially you guys and girls that have, have managed to get online and stay online for this amount of time. So from, from both of us, a huge, a huge thank you for taking part in this. And um, yeah, the, the stuff that you guys do is uh, hugely inspirational. Dubai is building the world's first temperature-controlled city. It'll have a shopping mall, an indoor theme park, and even a network of temperature-controlled promenades. The Gulf state can top 40 degrees in the summer, so the move could prove pretty popular with tourists. Buzz Aldrin, the second man to set foot on the moon, thinks the first people to land on Mars should never return to Earth. Aldrin said this wasn't a suicide mission, but instead the beginning of a permanent settlement on the red planet. Elon Musk, who founded the commercial space firm SpaceX, has said he thinks humans will start landing on Mars within a decade. It's hip to be square. At least that's what struggling smartphone maker BlackBerry is hoping. It's bringing out a square phone called the Passport. According to BlackBerry, it's for architects, writers and medical staff and will be able to fit 60 characters across its screen instead of the standard 40, making it ideal for reading documents, apparently. Now, if you're into gaming on mobiles and tablets, you're in for a treat. Here's Holly Nielsen with her pick of the latest iOS releases. Thomas was alone. Well, a weird first thought to have. If it's a platform with a lot of character you're looking for, then Thomas was alone is definitely one to look out for. Brought from the PC version, which was created in 2010, the iOS port works really well. You play as Thomas or any other kind of square and rectangle, each with their own complete uh, different personality and abilities. And they have to help each other to get through the level and through the puzzle. It's a masterclass in how characteristics can be shown without relying on aesthetics. Each is just a simple square with a colour, but because of the brilliantly narrated dialogue, which is also very well written and it's narrated by Danny Wallace, um, you feel like you really get to know these little squares and you do really get emotionally attached. Spikes? That was new. Claire avoided them. It works really well um, with touchscreen controls. Um, I actually prefer it uh, to the computer controls just because it's easier to select which character you want. Even for those who have played it on PC already, the iOS port is so well done and the controls are really good, really clear, and of course the story will want to make you play it over and over again. I would say there's for newcomers and for people who've played it, there's something to draw them to it. V, 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 not an easy name to say, but definitely worth playing, although not for beginners. It is a very difficult game. It was notorious for it back when it was brought out in 2010 for the PC. And the touchscreen controls do make it that little bit more difficult. You play as Captain Viridian, whose spaceship has crashed, and you need to find all your crew members who are scattered around this world. You control Captain Viridian, um, and instead of jumping, you flip gravity. So Captain Viridian can only then flip gravity again once he is back on the ground. This makes it very difficult. <laughs> the satisfaction you get when you've completed a difficult bit is like no other. So it's definitely worth it. It manages to balance frustration and kind of joy <laughs> very well. Leo's Fortune was developed by 1337 and Senri LLC. It's a platformer, but with kind of physics puzzle elements to it as well. You play as Leo, who is a blue ball of fluff with a moustache and a really strong Eastern European accent. Mm. I wonder how it works. I love that character. Um, Leo has lost his fortune, as the name would suggest, and you go on a journey to find out who stole it. The controls work really well with the pacing of the game. The iPad touch controls aren't too fiddly, always feel in control. It's just a beautiful looking game. It almost has a kind of Dickensian steampunky type feel, and also has really good replayability, so it's one that you'll be coming back to. <laughs> the first thing that will really capture you about Monsters Ate My Birthday Cake is the kind of gorgeous little cartoony art style. It's very cutesy, but you shouldn't be kind of taken in by that because it actually does become a very difficult puzzler.
You play as Nico, who is a little boy, and monsters have eaten his birthday cake. So he goes across his island with the help of three friendly monsters, each of different abilities, to try and get back the pieces of cake. At first, the controls seem very slow. You have to touch and swipe to control where they go and then double tap to interact. And it seems a bit cumbersome, a little bit slow at times. But as the game progresses, it actually becomes less noticeable as you kind of get into the puzzles and it kind of starts to work for it a bit more. That's it for this week. Don't forget you can catch up with all the breaking tech stories all week on our Sky News for iPad app, our smartphone apps and skynews.com. See you next time. Bye-bye.